You know, when God anoints you as a child, you can walk through many a storms, trials and tribulations. You do some supernatural things. And this man has done some supernatural things. And we are so thankful for him. I'm thankful for him because the vision that God has given him, we see in our daily lives. I see him late in the midnight hours when he is praying to God and God is speaking to him supernaturally. And we just thank God for Bishop Redfern. I thank God for my husband. I thank God for my leader. I thank God because I know that God put him in my life because I know the change that God has, has what has happened to me because God has put him in my life. And God has given me the presence of mind to allow him to be my leader. Because, you know, you have a choice. You have to decide whether you allow your husband man to be your leader. And that's what God has, has allowed me to do, and I am thankful for that. So this morning, I present to some and introduce to others the Bishop Redfern II. After a selection from Hearts Cry, the next voice you will hear will be Bishop Redfern.
started rejoicing and being glad. Let, let us pray. Oh God, we come standing in the need not of a blessing but a miracle. Lord, we are asking that something would take place today in each of our hearts. That they might be changed and we won't leave here like we came. God, we ask that your ministering angels would encamp around us to give us a measure of safety even from our own thoughts, that we might be an instrument of your love, an instrument of your service, and we might be a very present help to this dreadful age. Now, God, I just ask that whatever I am, I acknowledge that you made it. Yeah. And whatever I should do, I ask that you would propel it. Yeah. And Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that they be completely yours. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Somebody ought to say amen. 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 First, I greet you in the name that's above every other name. I greet you in the name of Jesus. But I want you to know it's Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Uh, there are many Jesus 
uh, that people are worshiping now. I'm more familiar with one from Cuba who played third base. But the Jesus I want to greet you, his name is Jesus Christ, the one from Nazareth. Because I think for so long we have not really paid attention to the person of Jesus Christ. We have not experienced a true personal relationship with the man and the God, Jesus Christ. I want to extend greetings first to my lovely wife who has done me great honor this morning. I want to thank her for being a wife, a mother, and a go-to person. Someone asked me, how did you select her to be your wife? I looked at her hands, and they were hands from Dillon County, South Carolina. They were hands that were very familiar in the tobacco fields. I looked at her knees. They were knees that were very familiar with the floor, cleaning on her hands and knees. I looked at her overall physical physique stood through every kind of adversity, every kind of hardship, and she could stand tall and call on the name of Jesus Christ. Some have debated whether she's smarter than me or am I smarter than her. I want to settle that question for you this morning. I am smarter than she is. And I know some of you ladies are repulsed by the even thought of that, but I'll have you to know that I had the wisdom, the insight to marry her. I don't know what she had when she considered marrying me. I want to extend greetings to the Honorary Host Committee and especially Brother Eddie Guest, who is primarily responsible for me standing here. It was Eddie Guest and Joe Grimaud who had the vision of a light in the city called Jesus. It was Eddie Guest and Joe Grimaud who walked through the impossibility of having 80,000 people in the Williams Bryce Stadium. It was Eddie Guest and Joe Grimaud who looked a half a million dollars in the face and said, there's no amount too big for our God. I want to thank Joe and Gladys Grimaud, for they have been a mother and a father figure in my life. And they were not afraid to lay hands on me in prayer and, of course, in chastisement. <laughs> I, I want to thank them for the insight of giving me to the heart and the person of Jesus Christ. I want to thank them for the introduction to Dr. Stephen Manley and the cross-style word where men and women are coming into subjection under the absolute word of Jesus Christ, who is the word. I, I just thank them so much. And then I want to thank each one of you in your own respective places, because this morning, this day is a special one. We're here under the unction of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I felt a special call just to be here this morning. And I know some of you thought about it, considered doing something different, but there was a special call just to be here. Say, there's something that's waiting to happen. As Gabe and Hearts Cry played, I, I heard the hunger in your heart for worship. I heard the hunger for a new day. But there are some questions before us today. There are some questions. There's a 15-year-old girl who's missing. Uh, there's another child who was found on the side of the road with a bullet in the back of his head. There's a young man who was found laying in a pond who had been shot twice in the head, and for 17 hours he laid there. Oh, teenage pregnancy is higher in South Carolina than anywhere else. And somebody said, uh, how much of a concern do you have about that? I have some concern, but I know that they don't know better because they are sinners. My concern is for the one out of two of Christians who get a divorce. My concern is for the Christian husband who's beating his wife. 
My concern is for the Christian who shows up on church on Sunday but is in a strip club from Monday to Friday. I'm not concerned about whether or not a man marries a man. I'm not concerned about a woman marrying a woman. That's something outside of the body of Christ. I don't even know that we can criticize it when we can't stay married in the proper context of marriage. You know, the worst thing in the world that can happen is for a hypocrite to begin to challenge somebody else. I think my Bible says you ought to check that mote in your eye before you start criticizing. I want to know that somebody is questioning the prayer in the schools, prayer on the playground. Well, in the Christian home today, it would seem that there's more HBO and BET than there is prayer. Come on, somebody, give me a hand. So this morning, I'm not going to lavish you with a recitation of scripture. I'm not going to cite scripture after scripture and, and just recite something that we've all recited, but it seems that it's coming from a dark heart. It's keen that it's coming from a confused mind. I want us to reason together this morning. I want us to consider the state of our society. Somebody is always concerned about the United States of America. They're concerned about the demise of this great society. But their neighbor next door is going straight to hell, and we refuse to go next door and present the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to consider with me this morning that this gospel that we share is not a collective. Christ didn't come to save a nation. Christ didn't lay on the cross to save a group. Christ was not crucified to save a church. He was crucified. He died. He resurrected to save the individual. I want you to know that until you go down to the DNA of the American society, that's each individual, until they have been witnessed, until they have heard the good news of Jesus Christ, don't expect the country to change until the individuals change. I wanted you to reason with me this morning. I wanted you to reason the questions that have troubled man from time immemorial. Who am I? What is my purpose in this life? Where am I? Am I a creature who was created by a God who had a purpose? I want you to know that even in the terms DNA, that our God put his signature on each creation that he made in us. I don't know whether you know what the D is for in DNA. It's for Deo, the first syllable of the pronunciation of DNA. And if you don't know what Deo is, I'll just say, Gloria, Gloria, in it shouts us, Deo. Oh, the Deo in DNA is our God. It's his signature in our DNA strand. We were not made to be animals. I want to explain it to you. You're having trouble understanding the behaviors of young people. It's not difficult. It's a reason that they call one another a dog. It's a reason that they point each other out and say, my dog, your dog. Yeah. Well, if you want to know why their pants are hanging down, because they're acting like dogs. Yeah. I want you to notice, anyone who knows anything about animals, the way a dog greets another dog is he walks up to the hind parts of the dog and begins to sniff. So when you see a young person acting like a dog with his pants hanging down, he's just doing what he's been taught to do as a dog. Right. You want to know why there's rampant sex, uncontrolled sex among the women and the young people, the teenagers? It's the same thing. They have been under the name of a dog. And a female dog, when she's in heat, she goes anywhere and does anything with anybody. I want you to understand that we have not considered the importance of naming something, the name that we give to it, that's the characteristic under which it begins to take. I want you to know that I began to consider this. When I was thinking about what they call existential philosophy, I began to look at Albert Camus and Friedrich Nietzsche. I began to consider Soren Kierkegaard. And I want you to know even Camus and Kierkegaard saw us as pilgrims, that we are strangers in a land that we are stumbling through. Oh, but Camus says we are stranger coming into a Christian court to be judged by our fellow peers. 
But Corker God said, I am a Christian and I am a stranger to this world. That this is not my home. That this is not where I exist. He said there's a relationship between man and God that's unbreakable. But then Nietzsche came. And some of you may remember this. Out of all the thinking and musings that he had, God was dead. The expression that God is dead. And the question was, any forensic scientist want to know who killed God? Who was it that killed God in the public sphere? Who was it that killed God in the marketplace? Who was it that killed God in the prayer? Who was it that killed God? I'll tell you who killed God. It was the church that killed God. You know, when you approach these young people and you say that you're a minister of the gospel, there have been so many hypocrites, so many liars, so many exploiters, so many people who wanted something other than what Jesus Christ promised us, that they cannot believe that there is a God. But I have good news. I have good news. God did not come to save a building called the church. God did not come to save a collective called the church. He came to save the individual heart that's called the church. So Aristotle, Socrates, Plato have considered the four causes that one thing can or man can exist. But even in these formal calls, efficient calls, all the expedient calls, efficient calls, there still remains the idea that man is an individual. We are not born together and we do not die together. We have a free will given to us by God. That we are not in a collective. That we have a personal responsibility to minister, to preach, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So where are we in the city of Columbia? Somebody is waiting for a revival. They're waiting for 80,000 to be in the stadium. They're waiting for the Coliseum to be filled. I will say to you right now, in no uncertain terms, that is not a revival. That's a crowd gathering. The revival that God wants is the individual commitment to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The commitment that God wants is when our heart becomes a throne of God, when our heart becomes his seated place of rulership. I want you to know that we've tried to contain God in some geographical, some time, location, continuum, but I want you to know that it is not South Carolina that will lead the revival. It is not South Carolina, it's not Columbia, but it's the heart of the individual. So where are we in city life? We started out 15 years ago with 80,000. And people come to us with events all the time and say, we want you to be with us. We will be with you. But that's not where our heart is. Our heart is not in an event. Our heart is not in a group, a collective. Our heart is in the methodology of Jesus Christ. We begin to search the scriptures. And we are finding that every time Jesus had a crowd together, he spoke for a moment, but he retreated. He ran from the crowd to the individual. I'm thinking that in Luke 6, around the 12th verse, he went into the mountain to pray. And all night long, he labored in prayer. All night long, he began to ask the Father, who is it that you would have me to minister to? Oh, I'm not seeing him preparing a vocation of ministry. I'm seeing him prepare to give a life to ministry. And that morning he awakened, and God had spoken 12 men into his life. Said, these are the 12 that you are to have. And he walked with them. He talked with them. He broke bread with them. He modeled for them. He taught them. So now we come to the modern church. The modern church is just a facility for a man to speak to a group. That is not the method of Jesus Christ. The method of Jesus Christ is to live with you to die with you. The method of Jesus Christ is to take on the personal responsibility of each individual. I'm driving up to the church and I see my parking space, pastor, bishop, and they got a special place for me to park. And I drive in and they have somebody to come and grab my Bible and grab my coat and they walk me in and put me in a special seat. 
and anybody who would want to come up and put a shield of defense. That's not Christianity. That's not Jesus Christ. That's somewhere the church took a left turn when it should have gone right. Oh, but where does that bring us? Where does that bring us? We're in America. Some would say the greatest country with the greatest achievement ever known to man. We have the greatest technology. Somebody said, I have the iPhone. Another one, I have the iPod. Another one said, I have the iPod. But I want you to know that there is an idea that came before all of those things. Somebody want to tell me how many gigabytes. Somebody want to explain that they got a terabyte. But I want you to know I got a God. Have mercy. It is personal relationship. City Light stands for personal relationship. Five years ago, we asked people to form a prayer group. And they said, well, how shall a prayer group be formed? So let us form it in the model of Jesus Christ. They said that the Christian, in pursuit of everything that the world has, they even bring in stripper poles in the church. They call it praise dancing. The world, in pursuit of everything that the church has, has seen that the model of Jesus Christ works. I want you to know it works. If you're going to get a football team, go ahead and get 12. If you're going to get a baseball team, go ahead and get 12. If you're going to get a jury, go ahead and get 12. If you're going to get a platoon or a squad, go ahead and get 12. It seems that everybody, every organized group of men understand that Jesus Christ gave us the kernel of social relationship when he called 12 disciples. I don't want to have Williams Bryce Stadium. I don't want to be in the Coliseum. I don't want to be in the convention center. Oh, we'll do that. But that's not where the action is. The action is taking personal responsibility for the gospel. I want to tell you about a lady who works so hard. I want you to know that she comes down to Christ Central on her lunch hour. She has to hurry up and work twice as hard in the morning so she can rush down and serve somebody. I want you to know that she has to rush home and take care of her family and minister to her husband. And her husband always has a smile. Come on, somebody. She has decided that the most important thing that she can do is establish a prayer group. I said, what is a prayer group? A prayer group is where you get together and recite scriptures over. No. A prayer group is where you vainly cry out words to the Lord, where everybody goes, oh, she prayed. No. A prayer group is a prayer sent by God to change this God-forsaken world. I want you to know that in City Life, we have come to the understanding that we have to be engaged, that every preacher, Every deacon, every steward, every minister, every member is a minister. And that the concept is that as a Christian, saved, sanctified, washed by the blood of Jesus, that I have a responsibility to ask the Lord to give me 12. And that I might minister to them. And do you know when you minister to others, everything you thought you had covered, they begin to minister to you? In Africa, we line people up single file. We line them up and said, now, the person in front is the leader. Said, so, well, turn around. Well, the person on the other end is now the leader. Said, so, turn to the side. All 12 of you are now leaders. Why? Because that's the model of Jesus Christ. You, you may want to know, why is the church dying in America? Some are holding on to the idea, oh, we're going to lose the church. I've gone in the congregation, and the, all the young people are gone, and the elders are standing there holding on. Well, if you do not share this gospel, if you do not teach this gospel, if you do not socialize this gospel, you will die. We've gone to Europe, and we began to set up prayer groups in Europe. And we're saying, oh, don't, don't you want to plant a church? No, we don't want to plant a church. Because as soon as you plant a church, that which was focused on the outside began to focus on the inside. That which was focused on the excitement of sharing Jesus Christ and allowing the Holy Spirit to work is now on a building committee. 
And after they build the church and having nothing else to do but preach the gospel, they said, well, rather than preach the gospel, let's build a family life center. And after building the family life center, and they said, well, rather than preach the gospel, let's build a baseball field. Rather than preach the gospel, let's build a social arena. I want you to know that this gospel that Jesus left requires personal sacrifice. It requires that you give your heart to somebody else. Oh, there are some people here who've decided that the world no longer owns them. They said, we're going to take our retirement and we're going to put it into the ministry of Jesus Christ. We want to take the facility that God has given us and give it back to him. They said, well, what will you do? Let's create a safe place that women can come from the struggles of life, get themselves together, and begin to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Oh, this day, Francis Schaeffer asked the question, how then shall we live? How then shall we live? Shall we live in the handcuffs of jewelry? Shall we live in the shackles of pearls and gold? Shall we live trapped in the houses where we hear an echo? So many empty bedrooms, so many children left out on the street, but we have empty bedrooms. How then shall we live? Shall we live in a used car dealership lot? When we walk out of our home, we have so many cars that the choice of which one to put gas in just disturbs us. Oh, how then shall we live? Shall we live a victim of our own church and religion? where we are arguing constantly about what happened in church, about the structure and organization of the body of Christ, where we don't agree with anybody, the preacher, the deacon, the member, how then shall we live? Oh, 2,000 years ago, a man came with that answer of how we should live. And his name was Jesus Christ. So I want you to leave this place this morning with a new idea, a new concept. I want you to constantly look at yourself and who you're touching. That if somebody cannot see Jesus Christ in you, then you have failed. If, he can, if they can't see that you are a Christian who can stay married, then you have failed. If they can't see how you raise your children, then you have failed. I want you to know that there are people you can walk right up to them and know that they're Democrat or Republican, but you got to shake your head and wonder whether they're Christians. Uh, this morning, this morning, I'm not concerned about the nation. The nation will take care of itself. I'm not concerned about the Democrats or the Republicans. They, of course, will take care of themselves. But I am concerned about the next generation. I am concerned about the boys and the girls who have never heard the name of Jesus except when someone used to curse or damn somebody. I am concerned that we don't have any proper role models. I am concerned that there's more filth on television. Even those who purport to serve Christ have nothing to say, but could you send me a donation? Come on, somebody. Maybe this morning, I've taken a radical departure. Maybe this morning I've lost my mind. Maybe I'm saying things that uh, make my wife, well, let me tell you. My wife came home and went to sit down in the living room after a hard day, and she walked in, and I don't know whether you've ever had a car repossessed, but if they ever repossess your car, don't you know you can't step in the spot where the car was? You walk around it. So my wife walks into the living room, and she wants to sit down, but something is strange. All the furniture is gone. And, and it comes out, where, where did my furniture go? I'm standing, I gave it away. So you, you gave my furniture? I found someone who needed it. Red fur. We went to church that night, and there was a, a very smartly dressed lady. And my wife said, oh, she has a dress just like mine. I said, she certainly does. <laughs> and she said, there's another one. Red fur, now, is that my dress? I gave it away. We came home, and there's a notice from the tax office. 
saying that uh, if you don't pay your taxes in 30 days, we're going to put your house up for sale. My wife looked at me and said, no, you didn't. I said, man, the Lord had need of it. She said, how can you live like this? How can you live continually giving and giving? Don't you think we ought to have something we can call our own? I said, if you would consider for a moment where all of it came from before we called it our own, I want you to know that God is giving seeds only to those who sow. Giving seeds to the sower. Oh, my time is gone. So much more I wanted to say. But I want you to know that City Light has charted a course where we're only trying to bring 12 men and women together to be a prayer. To go into the schools as Vanessa Frazier and her prayer groups, calling the young people together, 5 o'clock in the morning to pray, to teach them who our God is. I want you to know that uh, our men on the wall prayer groups are going and raking yards of the elderly, painting houses, and doing house repair. They want to not just pray, but be a prayer. I want you to know that in Uganda, in a place called Maga Maga, there are 100 prayer groups who have come together and they are building, building a campus to train other prayer group leaders. And I said, well, how can you build a campus with no money? They say, brick by brick. I said, well, what do you mean brick by brick? Of course it's brick by brick. But they call all the prayer group leaders in and said, next Sunday, I want you to come and bring a brick. Hallelujah. When a hundred leaders went and got their 12, and you got 1,200 people bringing one brick, what started out as a little brick began to grow to a pile of bricks. And I said, well, how will you build it? They said, brick by brick. They began to take 1,200 people, pour out the marble, and each one could come and put their brick on the building. Come on, somebody. We are the body of Christ. I close by saying, we have asked you to come today so that you might sign up to be a prayer group leader. You in this room, we're asking that you would find or ask the Lord to give you 12. 12. And that for the next year, you walk with them and talk with them, that they might call you and the Lord Jesus Christ their own. The book of Ephesians, the third chapter, starting at the 14th verse. It is for this reason that I bow on my knees before the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom every family in heaven and earth is given this true name. I ask God from the wealth of his glory to grant you according to his riches that you might be strengthened by his might and the spirit of your inner man. I ask God that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you be so rooted and grounded in love that no man, no God will ever come against you. May you be so filled with his spirit that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, the height of God's love, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, philosophy, that you might be so filled with the very nature of God. And now, unto him, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think according to that power that worketh in us unto him. Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And those who love the Lord say, Amen. Those who praise the Lord say, Amen. Those who serve the Lord say, Amen. And I say, Amen. Amen.